Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining this session. My name is Jeffrey Shubb, and I'm the Executive Director of the Coalition for Green Capital. And I am thrilled and honored to be with you all today, leading this discussion on green bank leadership with esteemed guests from around the world. This is session three of the Green Bank Design Summit, Green Banks and Climate Leadership, a discussion with countries on green banks to catalyze job creation and infrastructure. Uh, the Coalition for Green Capital, my nonprofit organization, has worked for over a decade around the world, particularly in the United States, to create and operate green banks. And it is inspiring to be at this moment and be leading this discussion with such esteemed leaders and policymakers who are putting this model to work. Uh, we have a very exciting discussion today with three leaders from around the world. We'll get into questions. We'll take audience questions. Uh, but before, before I go further, I want to hand it off to my colleague, Salem, we can provide a little bit of background on an explanation of, of the technology that we're using, particularly for the translation. And then I'll go into a little bit more of an introduction and kick off the session. So Lem, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, hello, everyone. And I'd like to inform you that this session will have a simultaneous translation in Korean and English. So to set that up, um, the first step would be for everyone to look at the bottom right of the screen, you should see the interpretation um, with an icon of the globe symbol. Please click that. And if you would like to hear this session in English, select English. And if you would like then to just have English playing um, and mute the original speaker's voice, please click mute original audio. So it's clicking the English interpretation symbol, so selecting English, and mute original audio. And we'd like to encourage all audience members to please put in their questions in the chat section of the Zoom. Um, and we will get to these questions later on in the, in the session. If you have any questions as well, you can put that in the, in the chat if you have tech difficulties. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So today's discussion will explore with each speaker their approach to creating and, and or operating green banks. And we'll have a discussion on how each of their countries are creating and using green banks to stimulate investment in green infrastructure, create jobs, and drive equity and justice in the fight against climate change. As this discussion is happening at a critical moment, the world is finalizing new national uh, commitments in advance of the COP meeting in Glasgow later this year. And we are most definitely at a tipping point where we need to halt all investment in fossil fuel emissions and radically accelerate the growth in clean energy investment. At CGC, we often say that this transition away from fossil fuel investment and towards clean energy is happening and it will continue to occur. And if time were not a factor, eventually the conversion to a clean power platform the world over would be complete. But time is a factor and we cannot wait for markets to take their own course and take their own time. We must accelerate the trends that private investors and markets are, are, have already begun. And that is the role of green banks to drive more private investment more quickly into this transition. And so that is the context and framing for today's discussion. So now I have the honor of introducing our first speaker, Representative Debbie Dingle. Her Congresswoman Dingle is in her fourth term representing the 12th District of Michigan in the U US House of Representatives. Her district stretches from the Detroit suburbs, the home of the American auto manufacturing industry to Ann Arbor and the University of Michigan. Before being elected to Congress, among many other distinguished accomplishments, Representative Dingle was the chair of the Wayne State University Board of Governors, and she has been an active civic and community leader where she is recognized as a national advocate for women and children. She has uh, more than 30 years of experience and has served at the General Motors Corporation where she was president of the GM Foundation and a senior executive responsible for public affairs. She is a respected voice in Michigan nationally, and perhaps most importantly for us in today's discussion, she is the lead sponsor of the Bipartisan Clean Energy and Sustainability Accelerator Act, a bill to create a $100 billion green bank in the United States. And just to speak personally, the, it has been an incredible honor and pleasure to be able to work with Representative Dingell and her office over the last few years on this policy. We would not be anywhere close to where we are to creating a national green bank without her her leadership and commitment in her fight for this policy. And so it's an honor for me to introduce Congresswoman Dingle to be our first speaker on today's panel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff, for that kind introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. 
And it's just great to be on with people around the world about an issue that so many of us care about. Uh, and it really is important that we have to combat climate change. It's very real. But we can also do it while creating good jobs and boosting our economy. And that's really the critical discussion we're having today. We stand at this moment in time that requires quick and bold action. And at the same time, we're in the middle of a global pandemic that's crippled the US economy, but economies around the world. It's increased unemployment. It has people worried about so many things. And we have to understand that, we have to address it. But first and foremost, we need to understand that the climate crisis is real and we've got to attack it from all sides. And that's why this summit, uh, and it's why I've been pushing for the Green Bank legislation in the United States Congress for a number of years now, and why I'm here with colleagues from around the world who are doing the same. The idea has been called many things, a national climate bank, a national green bank, or now, We've reworded it again. The legislation that I'm leading in the United States is a clean energy and sustainability accelerator. But no matter what the name is, the purpose and the mission are clear. Scale a proven model to put people to work and decarbonize our economy. It would do this with an upfront capitalization of public funds, which would then be used to drive hundreds of billions of dollars into clean energy businesses and activities across the entire country. I come from Michigan, as Jeff said. This proven Green Bank model is flourishing around the country. And in my home state of Michigan, it's saved, uh, now it's driven $7 billion of total clean energy investment. That means that there've been three private dollars for each Green Bank dollar. We not need to drive this job creating, bill lowering investment into every community, not only in America, but around the world. And hopefully with the help of everybody at this summit. The bill I introduced, the Clean Energy and Sustainability Acceler Act, will make that happen at the national level in the United States. We have the support of the administration. It took some work, but they are there. Initially, some people were trying to keep it at a $27 billion proposed investment for this specific legislation in the American Jobs Plan, but we are making it and working hard to make that bigger. Uh, and recently, Secretary of Energy Granholm called green banks a hugely promising strategy, both for deploying clean energy and especially in the communities that need those benefits. Now we've got to work together and advance this legislation in Congress. It has the power to help us achieve a net zero clean economy, and most importantly, boost jobs across the United States. We can't wait any longer to invest in this. I've been working with my colleagues, Senators Markey and Van Hollen, on this issue for a number of years. In 2019, I introduced the accelerator legislation and in the House, where I'm from, we passed it, the bill two separate times in 2020. We know this strategy works and we need to take the Green Bank concept and bring it to that federal level. We've seen it work in the States. Now we're trying to make it national. With the legislation that I have and trying to get the White House to support, and I think we're getting there, we'll provide $100 billion of upfront capitalization to the independent nonpartisan nonprofit community, which will then finance clean energy and climate related projects that require upfront investment, but cannot easily access the capital. And it will do so in ways that leverage private co-investment. Given the gravity and the scale of the crisis we're facing, it cannot be overstated how important the level of funding is for this effort to be a success we have to invest enough. Independent analysis found that the $100 billion public capitalization will cause $463 billion of total investment in four years and nearly $900 billion of investment over 10 years. 
And this investment spread across the geographies and sectors will create nearly 4 million jobs in the first four years of activity. That matters. People are afraid that if we address global climate, they're gonna lose their jobs. We have to create more and show people how we're going to do that. And by using the proven green bank methods, the accelerator will draw in private capital from banks, investors, community development, finance institutions, credit unions, and others who are trying to put their capital to work in productive and environmentally beneficial projects. The nonprofit is authorized to invest across a range of sectors that include clean transportation, renewable power, building upgrades, and resilience. And importantly, the legislation requires that 40% of the investments go to disadvantaged, low income, fence line, minority, and transitioning communities. This will ensure that no community is left behind in this transition to the clean energy future. It will also expand the network of state and local green banks for every state in the United States. Specifically, the accelerator will provide the necessary funding to create green banks in every state in the country. And those green banks in turn can make investments into their clean energy economy based on local needs and conditions. And many of these decisions need to be made at the local level. They understand the business needs, the, the, the economy of the local area best. In every case, the investments will lower energy costs, make homes and communities more resilient, create jobs and improve public health. Green banks are market driven and support investment and market growth where there is business and consumer demand. This policy has a decade long bipartisan track record in the United States at the state level. And now we're trying to build that bipartisan federal support. Not everybody around the world knows some of the characters, but Don Young from Alaska, is one of our lead co-sponsors and that, that is major. As I mentioned, President Biden has expressly endorsed this policy as part of his proposed infrastructure package in the America Jobs Plan. With support from the White House, growing demand for Green Bay capital from state leaders of both parties and bipartisan support in the Congress, this policy should pass both the House and Senate with strong bipartisan support. And that's what I'm working hard for in this country. We don't have a moment to lose in this climate fight. This, the accelerator can play a meaningful and immediate role in reducing carbon pollution and expanding, in my country, good American job opportunities. But around the world, as each of us look at our proposal, job opportunities in every country. So I want to thank you for inviting me to be here today. I'm eager to work with all of you to ensure that we can deliver the benefits of green banks in my country, and we want to work together in partnership to do it around the world. And I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, for those inspiring words and call to action, and again, for your incredible leadership on, uh, on this policy. Um, I'm now uh, uh, pleased to turn it over to my colleague, Leo, to introduce our next speaker for today's discussion. Leo. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I cannot stop my video. Um, I think host needs to allow me to stop my... Okay, there you go. All right. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, uh, wherever you are. Um, first of all, I'd like to really thank uh, colleagues from Rocky Mountain Institute, Green Finance Institute, and NLDC for organizing the session. Uh, also, special thanks to Congresswoman, you know, Debbie uh, Dingo uh, for your, you know, very insp inspiring speech and leadership. Also, you know, looking forward to hear from Ian from, you know, CFC, uh, and because it, it, it's been a very exciting journey, I'm sure, for uh, Australia. Uh, because the CFC, you know, really has been, you know, leading by example. So I look, re I really look forward to hearing from Ian today. So first of all, um, you may wonder why entities like Green Climate Fund uh, is involved in, you know, creating green financing institutions or green banks uh, around the world. Um, 
mainly because we do believe that this is you know one of the this catalytic investment vehicles that can unlock the private investments at scale, uh, especially in developing countries. Um, as you know, GCF's mandate is to support developing countries to finance climate mitigation and adaptation activities. And uh, we are of the view that you know green bank can really deliver uh, what we intend to achieve. And really, we hope to replicate the Mongolian Green Finance Corporation and the Development Bank of Southern Africa's climate finance uh, facility model across other developing countries as well. Uh, and in Korea, uh, as you know, GCF uh, is uh, you know, uh, hosted by Korean governments uh, many years ago. So we are based in a, a small town called Songdo in Incheon near the airport. And uh, we've been working quite closely with the Korea as our host country uh, to you know, set up a green bank by sharing uh, you know, best practices. Um, and it's been really an honor uh, personally to have uh, you know, contributed this, to this green finance bill, uh, including the establishment of a Korea green bank alongside uh, the member of parliament, uh, Min Youngbae, who I'll be introducing to you in a moment. And I really would like to express my sincere gratitude to MP Min Youngbae for his leadership and dedication as he has been championing this effort within the National Assembly. I mean, you know, joining this session at 9 p.m. Korea time, uh, I think does demonstrate uh, his firm commitment. Um, uh, just a quick introduction of uh, MP Min, Heung Bae. So MP Min is a lawmaker of the ruling Democratic Party of Korea representing Gwangsan District in Gwangju, metropolitan city. Uh, and he is the key member of the National Policy Committee at the National Assembly in Korea. Um, just so you know, for his speech today, MP Min will be speaking in Korean. So please, you know, change your interpretation channel to English if we haven't done so already. And he will be using PowerPoint slides. So without further ado, please allow me to hand over to MP Min Youngbae. Thank you. I need yeah, Achimna,尊敬,尊敬,尊敬,尊敬,尊敬,尊敬,尊敬,尊敬,尊敬,尊敬,尊敬,尊敬,尊敬,尊敬,尊敬,尊敬,尊敬,尊敬,尊敬,
제가 작성한 그래서 발의해 둔 법안의 조문을 좀 보여 드리겠습니다. 조금 전에 말씀드린 것처럼 오늘 세미나 주제인 그리고 이 법안에서 가장 중요한 녹색 금융공사 그린뱅크 설립에 관한 것입니다. 기후위기 대응 관련 자금 공급을 확대하고 녹색 금융을 촉진하기 위해서 어, 한국 녹색 금융공사를 설립하도록 했습니다. 이 녹색 금융공사는 대출, 투자, 보증 등 금융 관련 활동과 함께 녹색 사업의 발굴과 자문 그리고 국제 협력 지금 오늘과 같은 이런 국제 협력의 업무도 함께 맡도록 그렇게 했습니다. 그러면 이 법의 주요 내용이자 오늘 세미나의 주제인 이 그린뱅크 한국의 녹색 금융공사에 대해서 조금 더 자세히 설명을 드리도록 하겠습니다. 먼저 왜 한국에 지금 그린뱅크가 필요한가 하는 부분입니다. 어, 두 가지인데요. 첫 번째는 그동안 한국 정부의 녹색금융이라고 하는 게 없었던 것은 아니지만 대개 실패한 역사를 가지고 있습니다. 대부분 펀드를 만들어서 이걸 집행을 했는데 결과적으로 민간 투자를 확대하는 민간 투자를 끌어내는 역할을 하지 못했을 뿐만 아니라 펀드 운용을 통해 실질적으로 그린의 가치와 환경이 개선됐다는 그런 결과가 특별히 보이지 않습니다. 그리고 두 번째는 문재인 정부가 내세운 2050 탄소중립을 실현하기 위해서는 금융을 전체적으로 관장할 컨트롤타워가 필요합니다. 그런데 이게 좀 이루어지지 않고 있고요. 그리고 세 번째는 민간이 감내하기 어려운, 민간이 감당하기 어려운 이 녹색 투자에 대해서는, 녹색 프로젝트에 대해서는 선제적인 투자가 이루어져야 합니다. 이런 선제적인 투자가 없이는 지금 문재인 정부가 내세우고 있는 2050년 넷째로는 어렵다. 따라서 그린뱅크가 꼭 필요하다. 이렇게 말씀드릴 수가 있습니다. 그리고 이 정책 금융기관들이 여러 가지 있는데 이게 이제 이 녹색 금융 공사를 통해서 서로 이해하고 대립하는 그러니까 이해, 이른바 이해상충을 해소할 수 있는 그런 장점이 있을 겁니다. 대개 지금까지 그 정책 금융기관들은 말은 녹색 금융을 지향한, 지향한다고 하면서도 실제로 탄소 배출 산업에 이 명분 그러니까 국민 경제 발전이라는 명분을 통해서 지원을 그냥 해 왔었습니다. 그래서 기존의 녹색 금융 체계를 가지고는 이 녹색 금융이 우선적으로 이루어지기 어렵기 때문에 신규 금융 기관을 만들도록 했고요. 이 한국 녹색 금융 공사의 운영 메커니즘은 지금 보시는 그림처럼 이루어져 있습니다. 그리고 이 녹색 금융공사는 또한 가지 초점을 맞추고 있는 것이 뭐냐 하면 지역의 균형 발전입니다. 그러니까 지금 한국은 극심한 중앙 집중적인, 중앙 집권적인 수도권 집중이라고 보통 표현을 합니다만은 그런 불균등 성장 때문에 지역 간에 대개 그 고른 성장의 기회를 갖지 못하고 있습니다. 그래서 지역별 녹색 금융공사 지부를 만들어서 지자체나 지역개발공사 등과 협업하고 전환이 공정하게 이루어질 수 있도록 한, 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 한다, 하자는 겁니다. 녹색금융공사의 예상 효과는 세 가지입니다. 첫 번째는 전문인력의 양성과 녹색산업이라고 하는 것에 집중할 수 있다는 점. 두 번째는 탄소중립에 들어가는 거대한 자금을 조달할 수 있게 해줄 거고요. 세 번째는 해상풍력처럼 장기적 투자가 요구되는 사업에 대한 전략도 도울 수 있다는 겁니다. 지금 이 법안은 작년 11월에 발의해서 올해 2월 제가 속해 있는 국회 정무위원회 상정돼 있고요. 이제 곧 심사가 시작될 겁니다. 물론 이 법안이 설립되면서 공사를 이렇게 새롭게 만드는 데 대한 우려와 반대가 있었습니다. 정부, 특히 이제 기재부와 산업부는 녹색금융 추진 속도 완화를 요청하면서 반대 의견을 내고 있습니다. 그럼에도 불구하고 녹색금융에 대한 필요성은 공감대가 상당히 형성돼 있고 공사 신규 설립 위에 다른 방안이 없는지 논의하고 있습니다. 제가 저희 의원실에서는 저희 당의 정책위원회, 금융위원회, 산업은행 이런 데 실무를 통해서 수정안을 도출했는데요. 올해 4월 실무선에서 어느 정도 수정안의 합의를 받습니다. 간단히 말씀드리면 당장 이 녹색금융공사 그러니까 그린뱅크를 설립하기 어렵다면 기존에 연관돼 있는 은행에 녹색금융지원센터 조직을 독립시켜서 운영을 한 다음에 이것을 그린뱅크로 만들어가는 그런 방법입니다. 이 과정이 국회 차원에서 하루빨리 
심의가 이루어지고 법안이 완성되기를 기대합니다. 지금까지 들어주셔서 정말 감사합니다. 전 세계 모든 나라에서 그린뱅크가 설립돼서 서로 교류하고 소통하면서 지구를 살리는 일에 함께할 수 있기를 기대합니다. 기회가 닿는 대로 오프라인에서 꼭뵐수 있으면 좋겠습니다. 고맙습니다. Thank you so much, MP Min, for the uh, for your remarks and for describing so uh, clearly the objectives and the policy pathway that's been laid out in uh, in South Korea, and uh, showing us the different ways that different countries are approaching this challenge. And the legislative uh, tactics uh, clearly show that um, South Korea is on a good pathway to creating a a strong and robust. National Green Bank as part of a broader national effort to think systematically about green finance. So thank you so much for the for your remarks and your presentation. Um, I now have the pleasure of introducing our, our final but certainly not least um, speaker, uh, Ian Learmonth from the Australian Clean Energy Finance Corporation. Ian joined the CEFC as the Chief Executive Officer in May 2017 with more than 30 years of experience as a financier and investor across markets in Asia, Europe, and Australia. He has worked in asset finance and securitization, clean energy, and major infrastructure projects, as well as pioneering social impact investments. Prior to taking the role at CEFC, Ian established Social Venture Australia's impact investing business which included raising impact and affordable housing funds, as well as launching Australia's first social impact bond in 2013. Previously an executive director of Macquarie Group for 12 years, Ian has investment banking experience in Sydney, Hong Kong, and London. He established and led various Macquarie businesses, notably European renewable energy and carbon credit investments, as well as cross-border structured finance and asset financing in Asia and Europe. And Ian uh, is now the CEO of the largest operating national green bank in the world. And so we clearly have a lot to learn um, from the incredible success that the, uh, he has achieved under that organization. And as those who have been watching around the world know, um, it has not been a, a always the clearest and easiest path for CEFC to stay on target as the politics of Australia have changed over its many years of operation. But here we are with the CEFC continuing to thrive and engage in incredibly innovative and critical investments. So we're really excited to hear about how you've done that, how you've stayed the course, Ian, and, and where the CEFC is going. And so I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, and uh, I hope you can hear me uh, <clears throat> okay. Good evening uh, from Sydney, Australia. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending upon uh, where you are. Um, I want to, um, firstly, I, I want to thank, con thank Congresswoman uh, Debbie Dingle and uh, MP Min for their presentations. It is just so encouraging to, um, uh, to hear about the ambition that's being uh, proposed in, in the United States and in Korea. And I wish, uh, wish you both all the best with your endeavours. Um, Australia, some nine years ago, um, established its Green Bank. And it was, um, it really came about when uh, a Labor government was elected here in 2012, and it needed to form a coalition to, uh, to, to, allow, um, to allow it to hold power. And to do that, the, um, uh, they formed a, a coalition or an alliance with the, the Greens, uh, the Green Party here in Australia. And as part of that, a deal. It was it was agreed that, that Australia would establish a ten billion Australian dollar green bank, which, if you think about the Australian economy, um, is actually very very substantial. And um, you know the UK set up its uh, green investment bank uh, for two and a half million sorry two and a half billion pounds, and the UK economy is approximately three times the Australian economy. So when you think about ten billion Australian dollars, which is about uh, five billion Australian pounds. It really is. It really is quite a substantial commitment. So we're very, very pleased uh, 
uh, of course, um, no, the, the, the relatively small country like Australia has such a significant green bank and, and we're pleased that it's been so successful. Now I've kind of led the Clean Energy Finance Corporation for the last four years. Um, so I can't lay claim of course to all of its success, but uh, I have, um, you know, I have been um, you know, leading the charge over the last four years and we've grown very, very substantially. Uh, let me tell you firstly a little bit about exactly who and what we are. Uh, so we were established under a relatively simple act, um, Act of Parliament, uh, and really the act it do doesn't necessarily say a whole lot. It's a relatively short piece of legislation, but it, but it says um, you've got $10 billion. You can, you can lend money. You can make equity investments. So you can do debt. You can do equity. You can't make any grants. We have other organisations in Australia that do that. Um, you should try, <clears throat> effectively, you know, you need to uh, you know, make a return for the taxpayer, although that's not necessarily explicit in the Act. And you can invest in under three headings, renewable energy, energy efficiency, or low emissions technologies. So, it didn't, it didn't specify any particular uh, area of the economy. Uh, it gave, gave us a very broad mandate to invest. And over the last nine years, we have committed cumulatively um, over $8 billion worth of, of, of investment. So our lifetime commitments is approximately uh, $8.8 .8 uh, We've Of that, we've deployed capital out the door in both debt and equities, approximately $7 billion over that period of time. We have had, in fact, $1.5 billion repaid uh, from either refinancings, the amortisation of loans, uh, or in fact, um, some of the assets that we've sold. About 50% of our portfolio is in renewable energy. And that in fact is a requirement of the Act. So we have done a considerable amount of wind and solar as the Australian economy over the last seven or eight years started to develop large scale wind farms and large scale solar parks. Um, we have now invested in something like three and a half gigawatts of renewable energy, predominantly as a lender, a project financier. So we have lent capital to wind and solar projects over that period of time, uh, often in cases where they may not have had contracting for the energy, which made them unattractive for conventional mainstream banks. Um, we have also invested in the other half of our portfolio. We've invested in, in many areas of energy efficiency in the economy, and that has, has manifested itself in, uh, in loans or in some cases, equity investments in sectors like the real estate sector, agriculture, transport, and infrastructure. So we've had a very, very broad range of, of sectors that we've been investing in. We are approximately 80, 85% debt, uh, sorry, 80% debt and about 20% equity. So we have, we've, we've been more a lender than an investor, but importantly, we have used equity in some cases to achieve a particular impact. One of the most important features of the Clean Energy Finance Corp, and, and you know, I hear that when I hear uh, Congresswoman uh, Debbie Dingle talking, is about also uh, facilitating third party investors alongside uh, the green, a green bank. And that is where you get, effectively, you get uh, your leverage. Um, and since we have been investing over, that, over the last eight or so years, for every dollar that we have put out the door, we've attracted in approximately two and a half dollars of third party capital. So we've always tried to, to play a role where we've seen a particular transaction, we think it's important, we think our capital will make a difference, and we think we're taking risks or we're playing a role that other investors or lenders wouldn't play but equally trying to attract, and I think that's an important thing to think about for those of you thinking of establishing green banks, we've always tried to play a role where we've been drawing in third-party investors so that for every dollar out the door, as I say, 
there's been at least two and a half dollars of third party capital. And that then means over our lifetime as a green bank, uh, we've had a leverage effect. And in fact, the value of the projects that we have invested in over our life is in excess of 30 billion Australian dollars, which is approximately 25 billion US dollars. Um, so we are, as I say, a very, a very broad based investor. Um, one of the, I guess, one of the important things uh, for us is that we have, um, you know, as I mentioned, we have tried to make an appropriate return for our investments. Now, um, the, the government directed us to make a return of approximately three to four percent above the five-year Australian government bond rate. Now that would, um, you know, that, that's a relatively high return, particularly when you're using debt as your primary um, product or investment, um, uh, your, your investment approach. So um, if you, if, if we've, in, in our life to date, our return on our portfolio has been closer to something like uh, two and a half percent over the five-year government bond rate. So, as I say, just slightly below the three to four percent um, margin above the five-year government bond rate that that we have, have been targeting, and that's because um, we've looked at all the transactions that we've done. We've looked at them on what's the appropriate return that we should be should be achieving. We haven't tried to have a hard and fast rule for all the investments we've been making. We've looked at them. We've looked at what role should we play? Do we need to be senior lender, secured lender? Do we need to be mezzanine finance, subordinated debt? Should we be equity in fact? Uh, should we be a long dated lender and offer sub-market interest rates to get this particular project up? Or is it more important that we, uh, you know, we take an equity position uh, to facilitate uh, senior lenders to, to come into this particular project? So we don't have any hard and fast rules. We look at what is needed um, out there, uh, and therefore, um, you know, each deal is is very much bespoke. If you look at our portfolio today, if I if I could tell you about the sort of main areas that we have been investing. As I say, we've probably, um, we, in terms of the, where our balance sheet sits today, we would have something like one and a half billion dollars of project finance, wind and solar, as well as large scale batteries. So we've been increasingly investing in storage in the uh, in the Australian energy market. Um, emissions in Australia, uh, approx of approximately thirty percent of emissions come from the energy sector. And we've historically been uh, an energy system that's run off coal. Australia has, of course, vast amounts of coal in the system. Um, and we've been trying to decarbonise the energy sector, as I say, through investing in renewables. And increasingly, as renewables has come into the system, and it's approximately 25% of the system today, we have been now investing in technologies to balance renewable energy like storage. So we've, we've, we've been lending in a limited recourse way to some of the large uh, grid scale battery projects here in Australia. In fact, there's some of the biggest battery projects in the world. Uh, they're Tesla batteries, but they're modular and they're, um, you know, they're, they're in, in, the, in the most recent case, 160 megawatts of storage, so very, very significant. We've invested um, in uh, in, in funds, we've supported funds that have been managed by private sector investor, investors in agriculture, in, um, as I say, in the real estate sector. So um, green uh, residential property funds, green commercial and office building funds. Um, we have invested in ag funds being run by people like the Macquarie Group, a very big global infrastructure investor. Um, and we've uh, also importantly invested in funds at the smaller end of the market where there might be a particular focus on a technology, for example, agricultural technologies. And so we have, um, you know, we have invested in ag tech funds. We, um, we have invested uh, over a billion dollars uh, 
in green and climate bonds. We felt it's important to support that market here in Australia. We've provided corporate finance to industrial companies, often at sub-market rates, to allow them to support business cases to move away from fossil fuels like gas, which is being, of course, used to drive a lot of industrial processes and to move on to electrification or other processes which emit far less carbon. Um, we have also lent uh, to banks and other financial intermediaries who then on lend using their vast number of business bankers and originators around the Australian countryside uh, to much smaller lenders. So people who might wanna just borrow $50,000 to put solar on the rooftop of their, of their let's say their, their farmhouse um, silo or sheds, for example, or buy agricultural equipment that might be energy efficient. We can't reach them, but if we provide sub-market financing to mainstream banks, they can on-lend to smaller borrowers around the country. Uh, finally, I'll mention that we, um, we also invest in the clean tech sector, um, where we make small equity investments in new technology, emerging technology companies that might be um, developing software for roof, rooftop solar. Australia is a world leader in rooftop solar. 25% of Australian rooftops have solar panels. Can you believe that? It's incredible. We, we install about two gigawatts of household solar every year. So solar uh, technology companies, carbon fiber wheel companies, um, electric bike uh, companies. There's a lot of in, uh, ingenuity here in Australia. And we are also a venture capital investor. So maybe just to wrap up, um, as I say, we have 10 billion Australian dollars. We can do a very broad range of things, debt, equity, preference shares, subordinated notes. We can invest right across the economy, importantly, as well as the energy sector, uh, the property sector, agriculture, infrastructure, transportation. Most importantly, Australia has a very low uptake of electric vehicles. And um, we are driving carbon emission reduction across the country. And to date, all the projects we've invested in, uh, once completed, many of them are complete, should abate nearly 10 million tonnes of carbon per annum. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak to you and I look forward to the, uh, the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, that was a very comprehensive, um, but very clear overview of your organization, your statute, your history, the context of its creation and the incredible range of activities and investments you make. I think there's a really important lesson in there around the kinds of flexibility, not only in, in terms of the kinds of financial products you can offer in terms of senior subordinated debt or equity, but the kinds of ways you can even engage in the market of providing corporate finance to an industrial company to figure out how to electrify their processes at the same time of doing sort of traditional straightforward project finance for a wind or a solar project in the entire range of, of sectors you identified. I think that kind of flexibility is, is essential to sparking the economic growth that we're talking about while also achieving uh, climate goals. And yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I know academically that uh, rooftop solar penetration in Australia is higher than in the United States, but 25% of market penetration is truly astonishing. And it's something that I think <laughs> the folks in the United States should be extremely envious of. It's, it's remarkable to have built a market to that scale. Um, so with that, I'm I'm very excited to open it up for for some Q and A with all of our panelists. So folks, if um, if MP Min and Representative Dingle and and Ian want to come back on for uh, a few minutes of discussion to wrap up the conversation, um, maybe Representative Dingle, I'll start with a first question for you. Um, we know around the world it can be difficult for governments to put money into green banks or really any major new initiative. Um, similar to the accelerator you're creating. Um, as you said, this bill passed twice last year and it has bipartisan support this year and there's a large number of stakeholders behind it. Why do you think this policy has found so much traction at this moment in the United States given our political context? Um, thank you for that question and to my fellow panelists, it was fascinating and interesting to listen to you. And I think we do need to build in our synergies between 
um, countries. I think that, um, you know, a, a decade ago, people, when they talked about global climate, uh, oh, I'm on mute. You, sorry. No, no I'm not on mute. Yeah, okay. Sorry, whoever <laughs> texted that. I'm off mute. Um, uh, but I, people just didn't think it was real. But I think that as you've seen the weather patterns, the fires in the West, the increasing hurricanes, uh, terrible flooding, that more and more people, Republicans and Democrats, recognize that it is uh, real and that it resonates and it's resonating across the aisle. So rather than to pass broad public policy, I think by investing and using the marketplace to encourage people to invest in technology that is um, going to make a difference by, you know, we're giving $100 billion of up from capitalization uh, to people to help finance these clean energy and climate related projects. Um, it, it will is a market. It helps the market get to where they are. They would not; these companies would not be able to get uh, funding from or easily access the capital. Uh, it's worked in the states. It's had a bipartisan record in the states. Green back, uh, green bank legislation has been signed uh, by Republican governors in Alaska, which is why I think we have done Young helping me at the federal level, Nevada. Uh, it actually, in my home state of Michigan, Rick Snyder was a very strong supporter of it, another Republican governor, and they're operating or in formation in states like Florida, which has a very conservative governor, Ron DeSantis, in Pennsylvania. So I think that it is a way for people, Republicans who, um, it, uh, who know that the issue is real, to be supportive of technology that's going to address the issue. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Congresswoman. And, and Ian, I guess a similar question for you, not so much around the political context of the creation of CEFC, but can you speak a little bit about the um, the work you've done and need to continue to do to maintain political support for CEFC and the work you're doing? And how do you ensure that you have the kind of uh, industry and policymaker support you need to stay on your mission? Yeah, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, it is absolutely um, essential that we stay in, in um, you know, close touch and support the, the government of the day. And the federal government, of course, uh, our kind of responsible government and our shareholder, in fact. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the government, and we, we meet, of course, very regularly and we, we stay in, in, in close touch with our minister and his office and, and the department of um, energy amongst other uh, other portfolios. And the Australian government, interestingly enough, their um, energy narrative or their policy objective is, is to pursue um, the investment in technology particularly and support uh, particular technologies and um, the priority technologies in Australia that are supported by the government. And then of course, in turn, um, the CEFC uh, is supporting. Uh, um, particularly green hydrogen, which of course I know many of you will be uh, countries that are thinking about green hydrogen. And so the government have directed us to invest um, up to $300 million into the, uh, the developing Australian green hydrogen market, green steel and green aluminium, soil carbon measurement, carbon capture and storage, um, uh, and, and long uh, duration um, storage itself. So, so be it long um, four to six hour battery or pump pump storage, hydro storage. So that the government's kind of um, very focused on a technology solution to carbon emission reductions. Um, and as I say, they're the priority technologies that the current government have have uh, are focused on and have directed us to turn our attention to. Now, one, there's a, I guess there's one qualification to that. Under our Act, we're not allowed to invest in carbon capture and storage. So we don't look at CCS. Um, other players might. But, yes, yeah, so um, very important that we reflect the government's uh, intention and policy directions, noting, though, that the Act that established the CEFC um, does state that the you know the minister of the day can't direct us 
to do a particular transaction or not do a transaction. So we do operate in terms of our investment decisions independently. But from a policy direction, um, we take many cues, if not most of our cues. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, it's a combination of cues from the government of the day and also what else, what is out there in the market that we can invest in? Where, are, where is the carbon? Where can we abate that, those carbon emissions? Can we, is there an investable opportunity? And that's when we set ourselves up to have specialties across the economy. Um, but when, you know, when the government say, we want you to invest in the security and reliability of the electricity grid with the uptake of renewable energy. And then of course, we've been out there investing in the grid, for example, which will allow a greater percentage of renewables. So it's, it's a sort of a very nuanced approach, but yes, we take direction from the government as we, as we also uh, take direction or, inf or are influenced by what opportunities there are to invest in the marketplace. And so one, one follow-up question on this, so I'll, I'll ask this because it's particularly germane in the conversation in the United States right now. You said the one technology in the one sector you cannot invest in is carbon capture and sequestration. Can you just explain a little bit more about the rationale for that? Is it based? Is it because of a perception of, of cost or return viability, or is it just a political decision that this should not be in your portfolio? Actually, Jeffrey, I take that back. Two things that we expressly can't okay. invest in. Nuclear, mm. in the act, nuclear in Australia has never had political support. Well, not in, you know, in decades, decades. And carbon capture and storage. Now, why can't we invest in carbon capture and storage? Look, it harks back to the original passing of the act. And uh, there was possibly a feeling that, you know, carbon capture and storage could have... and Look, I'm I'm speculating to some degree. I wasn't I kind of wasn't there on the day, but uh, you know, might that have ex extended the life of coal-fired power stations in some way? So we don't do carbon capture and storage. We look at other things like soil carbon sequestration, forestry forestry sequestration. We have are uh, looking at opportunities in that regard, but today, yes, we we cannot invest in CCS. Okay, very interesting. Not surprisingly, the two technologies that you identified, nuclear and CCS, are the two hot button ones that come up in, in most of our conversations around policy in the US, around uh, the National Green Bank. Um, so and MP Min, I'd love to send the next question in uh, your way, if you can, if you can hear me. Um, so one question is, what are the major challenges in creating the green finance corporation that you proposed and is necessary? What is the fallback option in case it cannot be established at all or on the timetable you are looking for? Hojuna 비로소 이 전담 금융 기관이라고 할수 있는 녹색 금융 공사를 설립하려고 하는 거고요. 어또 하나 걸림돌은 사실은 정부가 여기에 대한 태도를 명확하게 하고 있지 않다는 점입니다. 사실은 2050년 탄소 중립을 선언하긴 했지만 아직 여기에 이르는 경로를 어떻게 구축할 것인지 어떤 방식의 접근을 통해서 이 넷째로 2050년 넷째로를 이룰 것인지에 대한 그 로드맵이 완성되어 있지 않습니다. 대개 어, 이, 이 말씀, 이런 두 가지는 사실은 한국에서의 이 녹색 산업의 개념 혹은 녹색 금융의 필요성에 대한, 필요성에 대한 논의가 그동안 오래되지 않았다, 매우 일천하다라고 하는 것이 이유일 겁니다. 그러면 이것을 어떻게 돌파해 나갈 것이냐 하는 게 지금 저희들에게 주어진 과제이고요. 어, 곧바로 은행 설립으로 가는 방안이 있고 또 하나는 중간 단계를 거치는 방안이 있을 겁니다. 지금 아직 입법 과정에 있기 때문에 어느 쪽이 더 효과적일지에 대한 논의가 
조금 더 깊이 있게 이루어져야 할 겁니다. 다만 지금으로서는 앞서 말씀드린 그런 장애, 장애 요인 때문에 가능하면 어, 중간 과정을 거쳐야 되지 않을까 싶습니다만 사실 누구도 지금 해보지 않은 길이기 때문에 이게 효과에 대한 그 확신이 없어서 여전히 지금 좀 어려움을 겪고 있습니다. 오히려 제가 좀 궁금한 게 있는데 좀 여쭤도 되겠습니까? 그 호주의 리어먼스 I, I will warn we are uh, we have about two minutes left, but I would love if you were, if you have a question, go for it. 네, 그 호주의 리어먼스 CEO님께 좀 여쭙고 싶은데 우선 지금 호주 그린뱅크가 민간과 정부 그러니까 호주 그린뱅크의 설립의 구성이 어떻게 돼 있는지 궁금합니다. 조금 전에 말씀하시기로는 정부의 지침하고 시장 상황을 결합해서 운영을 하신다라고 하셨는데 그렇다면 이건 공공기관인 겁니까? 아니면 공공과 시장, 민간의 합작인 겁니까? 아니면 민간으로 독립되어 있는 기구입니까? 이게 되게 궁금합니다. 그리고 만약에 이게 그런 어떤 성격에 해당되는지 모르겠는데 이런 이런 분야와 이런 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 분야에 대한 투자나 이런 이런 목표를 세우는데 이것은 완전히 독립적으로 이루어지는 겁니까? 정부의 지침이 매우 중요하게 작동합니까? Thank you for those questions, uh, Mr. Min. Um, we, um, so as I, as I say, we, uh, we're not directed, we're, we're directed by the government um, from time to time to focus on particular sectors. For example, green hydrogen, $300 million, recycling, $100 million, and Clean, we were instructed to invest in clean technology, $200 million. Um, but we have, a, we have $10 billion. So then we, have to, we decide ourselves what the rest of our investments might be. And, and how we approach that is we look at where is the carbon, where is carbon emissions, where are they, are they, where are they essentially located in the economy, the energy sector, Um, scope two emissions across, um, you know, the property sector, uh, for example. So we, we uh, and and of course uh, emissions related to the resources sector and industry, um, as well as as transportation. And then um, you know we kind of are also looking at ways of sequestering um, the balance or non-energy emissions in our sector. So we have some directions uh, from our minister and our government. Uh, but otherwise, the act sits in there, and and we have to decide where we direct our uh, focus, uh, and how can we use our capital in the most efficient way, and attract in a lot of other private sector investors to abate the most carbon in the economy and make an appropriate return. So there's there's lots of different levers pulling in different directions. Uh, but that's the challenge of um, of operating a green bank with a very broad mandate. Ian, I'm, I'm unfortunately I'm going to have to. Uh, I would love for this conversation to continue because this is exactly the kind of dialogue we want to create, and I think all of us should follow up together. We can build connections, and I I personally am learning a lot. This is what I do for a living, and learning even more in this conversation. So. Thank you so much to MP Min and to Ian and to Representative Dingle for joining us. This has been a fascinating conversation. This kind of global comparative discussion is really uh, stellar and we need more of this. So um, uh, thank you again, everybody for joining us. If you wanna continue the conversation on the very next session that I'm hopping over to, a deeper discussion on a, uh, the return to American leadership on climate change through the National Climate Bank Act with an ex a group of esteemed speakers. So thank you all very much for joining us and thank you to our panel for such a wonderful discussion and hope everyone has a good rest of the day. Bye everybody.